Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Christmas at Capital Bible Church, Christmas Sunday at Capital Bible Church. Somebody asked me, why do they call it Christmas Sunday? Because it's not Christmas. I know, but it's because it's the Sunday before Christmas. So whatever Sunday is the Sunday before Christmas, they call Christmas Sunday. Now, you can call any Sunday Easter Sunday. The pastor I grew up under, Pastor Howard Bertner, used to tell us that. He used to say that uh, every Sunday uh, is, can be Easter Sunday because the disciples began worshiping on the first day of the week to commemorate Jesus Christ's resurrection. And so for believers, every Sunday is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, and the Sunday before Christmas is Christmas Sunday. There's a little bit of Christmas trivia you didn't know you were going to get today. Let me welcome the uh, online people as well. We're glad that you're joining us. And uh, those of you that are here uh, on site, if you are on Facebook on your phone, if you could be kind enough to give us a check-in, that would be great. And uh, that lets people know uh, that we're here. And people are looking, by the way, for uh, in-person services. because I know that because we got a, uh, a, com a email through our website, the church website, last night. Uh, a gentleman asked if we had Christmas Eve, in-person Christmas Eve services, and if so, what time? So I was happy to email him back and let him know, yes, we do. Our Christmas Eve service will be at 6 o'clock uh, on Christmas Eve. Uh, this morning, we're going to be celebrating communion. And uh, if those of you who are here, if you uh, didn't pick up one of your uh, communion cups, I got to be careful. I don't call them coffee creamers because they look like that. But, uh, and uh, again, I apologize in advance that these things are not easy to to open up uh in fact i wouldn't do it early because it'll spill on you and uh th there's two little tabs you got to get the top one is the hard one okay that's a that's the one that's invisible and that's where the wafer is now those of you at home you might say well we'd like to do communion but we don't have one of those well here's good news for you god doesn't care what you use and i'm not being flip or sacrilegious when i say that but if you're at home and you like to celebrate communion with us if you're on online uh, you can get anything for juice, and you can get anything uh, for a wafer, a cracker, or bread, or whatever else. Up front here, some other. If you, if you didn't get one, raise your hand. And uh, all right, we have all over the audience, so we'll ask them to keep their over here. Ernie, did you get? You need one. They need one over here and in the back. So, uh, if you're online and you'd like to take communion with us, just get some juice and get a piece of bread, a cracker, whatever. Because it's not what it is. I was talking to TJ, one of our teams, about this. And uh, we talked about the fact that it's not, he, he said, they don't taste very good. So I'm warning in advance from TJ, the little round wafers are tasteless. However, I told him it didn't matter what they tasted like. He said, I said, anything can be used because it's not what it tastes like. It's what it represents. See? And we'll share that, of course, before we take communion together. He said, you could use plastic. Then I said, well, I don't think people would eat plastic, but, you know, typical teenager, right, TJ? Yeah, right, what can I say? Anyway, we're glad to have you here. I'm glad we can go to church and rejoice in the Lord and have a good time as we worship him together. We're going to begin with singing a familiar Christmas carol. This is probably one of the favorites that people enjoy. So if you feel like it, stand up and sing with us, Away in a Manger, Away in a Manger. Jesus. 
Thank you very much. You may be seated. Thank you, praise team. Just a couple of praises that we'd like to share with you. I appreciate those of you that prayed for the uh, services that we conducted yesterday for uh, Lorraine Morris's daughter, Crystal Moret. Um, it was a private family service, and there were only about 20 people that were there, two rows of people. However, they asked me when I got there if I minded that they would Zoom it and uh, not only put it out through Zoom, but then have people share by way of Zoom. I said that would be fine, and it worked very well. That was another, uh, another benefit, blessing of uh, technology. And uh, I have to confess to you, I always expect people to get saved at funerals because that's the time that people think most about eternity. And if you preach the gospel and invite people to be saved, usually God saves some. I can't save anybody, but God does, all right? But you have to, you have to ask people if they'd like to be, all right? And by the way, that's a, that's a tip for you about your witnessing. A lot of people say, well, I witnessed there a lot of people, but nobody ever got saved. And I sometimes will say to the person, if it's appropriate at the time, well, did you ever ask them if they wanted to be? Say, because... If you, if you witness and give them the whole plan of salvation, but then you don't ask them, here's what that's like. That's like if you're a salesperson, you give a whole sales presentation, but then you don't say, would you like to buy some? Now, no salesman that's worth his salt would ever give a presentation if, you know, to a potential customer and not say, would you like, would you like to buy any? See? And uh, so when we give the gospel, it's, and again, it's not all, every situation is different. I got that, okay? But uh, I believe strongly that we ought to give as much as we can invitations to people, opportunities for people to respond to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if, by the way, if they reject and say, no, they're not rejecting you, they're, they're rejecting the Lord ultimately, and uh, you plant the seed. Yesterday, uh, God saved 10 people at the end of that service. And I was, I was amazed that there were that many. We had five at the service for Jared Fairley. And there were many more people there. But it doesn't matter how many people there. It's, it's what God knows people need. And uh, we also don't know by way of Zoom. There are a lot of people watching on Zoom because people afterwards thanked me for the service. Other people in the family that weren't able to be there. So it's potential that there are other people that could have been saved through Zoom. So you never know. That's the, that's the truth of that. You never know when you give the gospel, whether you give it out loud or give it by a track. You never know when... Uh, God's going to use that to reach people, and eternity will reveal that uh, to you, and I believe there'll be people in heaven. If you've been faithful to give a witness and give out gospel tracts, people will be in heaven because of your witness that you didn't even know, and uh, I believe they'll come and thank you, and after we have communion today, we're going to give an opportunity for testimonies. I want to share a testimony from a friend of mine uh, about that issue of, of passing out tracks but thank you for your prayers uh, I want to also praise the Lord for the giving that you've been doing uh, we've been collecting not only the tithes and offerings for the church uh, throughout the COVID thing uh, and we have to be creative and so we have an offering plate at the door there people can give in that as they wish to because they go in or out but then people also can give online and people can also give through the United States mail um, and we've been collecting, as I said, the money for our missionaries. That's why we run those slides at the beginning of the service uh, on, the, on the live stream. And praise the Lord, so far we've collected $4,370 that you, you all have given to the missionaries. That's over and above what people have given to tithes and offerings. And we've got one more day yet today uh, that we'll do that. So uh, if you'd like to add to that missionary offering, uh, you're welcome uh, to do so. And uh, we appreciate, and I want to thank people, people that maybe have never had the opportunity to come to this church. Some people live in the city of Harrisburg and surrounding, and other people live far away who have given uh, to the ministry. By the way, if you do live far away and uh, or nearby, and you'd like to get a CD of this uh, sermon each week, we do send those out. They're free of charge, and uh, every Monday, Donlin faithfully uh, runs those and puts them in mailers, and we mail them out to people. And they go across the country, and some here in Harrisburg. So if you'd like to have that, 
You have to have a CD player, obviously, to play it. But if you'd like to have that, uh, let's let us know. We'll be glad to make that available. How many people have loved ones in your family that are sick right now you'd like to request prayer for? All right. That's lots of hands all across the audience. Uh, let me especially mention one of our uh, members, Herman Beers, Tom Basham's father. Uh, he's at home quite sick. They, uh, they thought they were going to have to take him to the hospital. And uh, he's been in the hospital. The, uh, the EMS people, uh, as they came and, and observed him, they remarked that he would probably be getting better care there uh, right now if, they, if his oxygen levels and everything stay up. Uh, then in the hospital, and so they they gave him more antibiotics and steroids. But keep praying for Herman Beers, please, because if he doesn't get better with his second round, then he's probably going to have to go to the hospital. And uh, he doesn't want to go to the hospital. And he asked Tom as he came to church this morning, if Tom would ask for everybody to pray for him. So let's please keep Herman Beers in your prayers. We'll also pray for all those that uh, that you mentioned as you raised your hand. Let's look to the Lord together now in believing prayer as we ask God to uh, do what only he can do in hearts and lives. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are my father. I thank you that you love me, that you love your children with an everlasting love. And I pray right now that for people that uh, may feel lonely and perhaps forsaken, perhaps uh, they're all by themselves. Perhaps they don't have anyone else that uh, they think cares about them. Help them to know that you care. And I pray that you would bring other Christian friends, uh, family members to, uh, across their paths, that people would reach out by telephone, reach out if they're online through social media, whatever way works for them to let people know that they're not forsaken, they're not abandoned. They're not alone. I thank you for your promise in your word that you will never leave us or forsake us. So help every one of your children, whether they live by themselves or are not, help them to know that you love them and you will not forsake them. You will never forsake your children. Thank you for that great promise. I pray for America. Our country desperately needs revival. We desperately need to look to Jesus. We thank you for the doctors and the researchers and the scientists. And we thank you for the vaccines that are being beginning to be administered. But Lord, we know that the hope for America is not does not lie with science. It lies with you. And we're grateful for what science can do. But we also know that science can't heal people of eternal death and only Jesus blood can do that and so I pray for people today that are going to hear the gospel I pray they would understand their need of receiving Jesus Christ personally as Lord and Savior and I pray that you would work in hearts and lives to save people to draw them to yourself Pray for the president, for the vice president, for the members of Congress, the Supreme Court. Help them to govern according to truth, not just political correctness. I pray that you protect the men and women in the military, those in law enforcement. Keep them safe. We know the world is getting crazier and crazier and more and more overtly wicked as murders increase and violence increases on every hand. So I would ask that you would protect those people who are faced and tasked with helping to keep the peace and maintain law and order. I would also pray for the doctors and the nurses uh, on the front lines in the battle against this virus. We know that in some states and places that hospitals are overloaded and overwhelmed. So I pray that you would just minister in a special way there and that soon that could be stopped and the hospitals could return to normal again. And I pray that America and the world would get your message that it's time to turn back to you to repent and to recognize that 
man needs you. Can't shut God out and make it on his own, even though he thinks he can. I pray for the missionaries. They are serving you around the world in this country and overseas. I ask that you would encourage their hearts, help them to know that we love them and care for them. And I pray that uh, you would keep them safe and healthy. I pray especially for Brother Pete Heisey, who had the serious, serious stroke and uh, all of the difficulties a year or two ago. I pray that you would bring back all of his memory. We thank you for saving and sparing his life. I pray you'd minister to him and to his dear wife, Julie, and their family and uh, continue to meet his needs and all the needs of your missionaries physically and spiritually and financially and emotionally. And I pray for people today right here at home that need your touch. I pray you'd put their, your healing hand upon them and uh, meet their needs. We know that many people need not only a healing physically, but spiritually, emotionally. People need financial help. Thank you that you promised to supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory through Christ Jesus. So I was to look to you as the provider of our needs. And I pray as we approach Christmas, in spite of the messed up conditions in the world, that people would remember that Jesus Christ was your gift and still is. And that he came the first time as a baby, he's going to come the second time as the perfect Lamb of God. And I ask that you'd help people to be ready, make sure they're ready, through the power of your Word and your Holy Spirit. Bless those that hear your Word today, not only from this pulpit, from the pulpits across the, the country and around the world, wherever the Gospel's preached. Thank you that Jesus said, if I'm lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. And so I pray that Jesus Christ would be lifted up and people would be invited to be saved. We know that you'll save as you promised to do. And so we give you praise and thanks for the way that you are working. We thank you that we're still able to continue to give out your word. Help us to keep on doing that till Jesus comes. We we'll ask all these things in the strong name of Jesus, our Savior, with thanksgiving. Amen. We're in a series right now called The Weary World Rejoices. That comes out of the that comes out of the carol, O Holy Night. The line goes, A thrill of hope, the, the weary world rejoices. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. The weary world can rejoice today in spite of the pandemic because of Jesus. And so today. I'm going to give you another reason why the weary world can rejoice. And that's our title for today, the title to today's message. Go ahead and put that up on the screen for him, brother. God's perfect lamb. God's perfect lamb. Now there's a text there that I'll refer to in the close of my message as we get toward the final points. And I will try to be brief today because of communion and testimonies. But who knows what brief means, you know, what the definition of that is. Revelation 5, 9. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And special special focus and emphasis there is that is on the phrase, you redeemed us by your blood, by your blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And I want you to remember the big idea that it is this. The baby Jesus was God's perfect lamb. Say that with me out loud, please. The baby Jesus was God's perfect lamb. One more time. 
The baby Jesus was God's perfect lamb. Now, if you have a question that pertains to the sermon, if you'll text it to me, I'll try to answer it while I'm speaking. If I don't know the answer, I will tell you I don't know. There's a lot of things I haven't learned yet. I'm still learning. And I, I'm not meaning that in any way, however you take that wrong. I'm just telling you, I don't know it everything about the Bible. So if you ask me a question I don't know, I'll tell you. I don't know and I'll look it up. Not right now, but I'll look it up. I'll get the answer to you. But if you wish to text me a question, uh, we can try to answer that for you while we're going through this, all right? And you say, what are you doing with your stupid phone? Well, I'm taking it off of auto lock so I can get your text. <laughs> all right? Let's go through this quickly. I've got lots of points. Lots of points. Eight. We're going to give you a point and a, and a scripture and a comment. Number one. Now, the reason that we need to talk about the baby Jesus as God's perfect lamb is because of number one. Everyone is born infected with the terminal disease of sin. Everyone. Everyone. And as I wrote my missionary partner letter for this month, I wrote it and contrasted it to the virus and the vaccines. And so I'm not going to do all of that, but I want you to just think about this. Thank God that everyone is not getting the virus, correct? Everyone's not. Now, I don't, that, when I say that, I in no way am minimizing all the people who have gotten it and those who have died by it, but not everybody in this country or in the world is going to get it. By contrast, everyone, no exceptions, but Jesus, everyone is born infected with the watch terminal. What's terminal mean? It means life destroying, okay? Life ending. You ter terminates, okay? The terminal disease of sin, Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 5.12, sin came into the world because of what one man did. That one man was Adam. We know that from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So you say, well, Pastor Bill, so what? So what? Well, here's so what, number two. No one can escape sin's consequence of death. No one can escape by themselves sin's consequence of death. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. And when it says death, it doesn't just mean physical death because everyone dies physically. It means spiritual death. It means the second death. In fact, that term, the second death, is in Revelation 21, 8. It's, it says at the end of that, which is the second death. It speaks of hell, which is the second death, all right? So no one by themselves can escape sin's consequence of death. 1 Corinthians 15, 21, that's the great resurrection chapter. I usually quote parts of this chapter at the beginning and at the end in my committal services when we have uh, graveside committal services. Death has come because of what one man did. But the rising from death also comes because of one man. In Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, all of us die. So you see, we are born with a sinful nature because of Adam and Eve. Now you might say, well, boy, I wish I'd have been back there because I wouldn't have done that. That's now nah, wrong. Sorry. Every one of us are born with a sinful nature, and every one of us choose to sin, don't we? You can't blame Adam. It's not like the old flip wheels on the devil made me do it deal, okay? It doesn't work. No one can escape sin's consequence of death. And so we come to number three, only, only. But I should have put only in capital, capital letters. Did you know that on social media, if you put stuff in capital letters, it's, you're shouting? That's a little bit of trivia. I thought I'd pass along to you. Don't use all caps because that means you're shouting at people. Okay? 
Or if it's a good shout, that's fun, wonderful, but if it's not, you know. And by the way, the other side of that coin is this. Do not ever, please, for your own sake, I'm trying to help you here. Don't, don't think that you know when you get a text from somebody how they're feeling. Don't think that they're mad at you. That's the people. We, we, people are, we're like that. We always you know, think, well, I wonder why, I wonder why they're upset with me. Who said they're upset? Well, then this text said, well, see, here's the deal, folks. Even though I know the caps thing, they say it shouting. But beyond that, words on a page or on a screen are flat. You know what that means? That means they have no emotion. They're, they, you give them emotion. Not only when you write them, you might have one emotion, but when a person reads them, they have another emotion. So don't automatically assume the person's angry at you. You don't know that. Okay. Only, underline only, only the blood of Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, can cure the sin disease. Scripture, Romans 5, 8, and 9, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Now watch, and since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. Since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not merely silver or gold. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. There it is. The precious blood of Christ. the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. And that's why I like that old hymn, What Can Wash Away My Sins? Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. By the way, years ago, churches that belonged to the National Council of Corpses, I'm sorry, I mean churches, uh, and that's not, even, that's not even a big deal anymore today. Uh, th but this is true uh, fact, sad, sad fact. They took out of their hymn books, when they were using hymn books, okay, back in the day, modernistic denominational churches, sad fact, they expunged, that's the word to use, they expunged from their hymn books all the hymns that had anything to do with the blood of Christ. They did. So you wouldn't find nothing but the blood of Jesus. You wouldn't find there is a fountain filled with blood. You wouldn't find all the other hymns that you know that talk about the blood of Christ. And you say, well, what was their reason? Here it is. And you say, this, this is gonna be this is gonna be stupid. Yeah, well, I didn't I didn't make the reason up. That's what they said. They said it because we don't have a bloody religion. Well, all that they're saying when they say that is that they don't believe the Bible or even understand the Bible. That's what they're saying. See. Because the blood of Jesus Christ isn't literally applied to your body, okay? 1 John 1, 7, the Bible says, The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, you say, well, what's the deal? What's, what's the hang-up with, with the blood? Okay, here it is. It's not a hang-up, it's the understanding. In the Old Testament, number four, the Lamb of God was prophesied. Now, there are two types of prophecies in the Bible. Two types, and it's important that you know this. By the way, I had a, a, one of my neighbors this past week as I was walking the dog, stopped his car by where I was walking, and I'm privileged to live on Whisperwood Lane with some other fine folks. And this neighbor stopped the car, and he was talking to me, he's a nice guy, and he says, uh, well, why don't you tell me what you really think about, and he named a guy that I mentioned last week in my sermon, which told me that he had watched the message. And, uh, and he said, you, yeah, he says, you didn't hold back on anything much, did you? I said, well, if it's in the Bible, if it's in the text, you know, then we have to teach it. You can't, you can't just not teach something because it's not popular, right? 
And I said, I consider, I said, that's what I've done for 40 years. I teach the Bible. And I haven't taught it all yet. I, I got that, okay? But I teach the Bible. If I didn't have the Bible to teach, I wouldn't be a preacher. Okay? I wouldn't have anything to give people. And I, when I, yesterday at that funeral, I said to people, when I stood up, I said, now I cannot give you answers. If you're looking to me for answers, human answers, I can't give you answers. Why does somebody at 50 years of age die? I can't, I can't answer that for you, all right? Other than, the, you know, sickness and disease. I said, so I can't give you peace and hope, but God's word can. Romans 15, 4 says, we, through the comfort of the scriptures, can find hope. And my friends, you need to know what God says in his word. You don't read the Bible every day just to, you know, check off a box and, you know, you did your, you did your duty. You had your, quote, your quiet time. You need to read it for your spiritual food and energy. Now, here's a fact that you need to know to understand the Old Testament, all right, and prophecy. There are two types of prophecies in the Bible. There are verbal or spoken prophecies where, you know, in fact, I'll give you an example of that. It's not even on the screen there. Genesis 3.15 is a, is a spoken prophecy God gave, okay? He said, I will put enmity, he spoke to Satan. He said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. That Genesis 3.15 is called the Pro-Evangelium, and it's the first, the first prophecy in the Bible about the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. You say, well, it doesn't mention anything about the virgin birth. No, but it says this. As God spoke to Satan, he said, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and watch, her seed. That's the virgin birth. Because when you speak in all kinds of other practical human ways about childbirth. You don't talk about the seed of the woman. You talk about the seed of man. And Jesus wasn't conceived by the seed of man. His, his father was God, the heavenly father. Okay? It was a supernatural miracle. So that's a spoken prophecy. Genesis 3.15, there God spoke it, all right? Now, you also have not just the verbal spoken ones. You have typical prophecies. And the word typical comes from the word type, which are symbols or types or pictures. And here's where the lamb comes in, all right? You have a symbolic prophecy in Genesis 22, where God told Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, take him up to the mountain and sacrifice him there. And Abraham did it. And the Bible says he got up early the next morning and went to do what God told him to do. That's the kind of obedience that pleases God right away. So he got up early. He got up on the mountain. His son Isaac was 12 years old approximately. Isaac could have run away. Abraham was over 100, all right? So, TJ, you think a 12-year-old could outrun a 100-year-old? <laughs> No doubt, right? Yeah. Drea, are you 12 years old yet? No, you're not. But I bet you you could outrun a 100-year-old, couldn't you? She's not sure about that one. She's never tried. Yeah. But you all get the point, right? Yeah. You say, well, so what's the big deal? So Isaac submitted himself to his father, and Abraham obeyed God. He put Isaac, he put the wood, because Isaac had said, and here it is, watch. To his father Abraham, my father, and he said, here am I, my son. He said, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Here it is, watch this, Genesis 22, 8. And Abraham said, my son God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Well, there's a prophecy. That's a, that's a verbal prophecy. And by the way, uh, Abraham didn't even know that he was speaking prophetically there. He was talking about God's going to provide somehow, so I don't have to kill you, but I, I need to obey God. So they went both of them together. And if you read that story later in Genesis 22, Abraham had Isaac on the, on the wood, and he had the 
the, the knife in his hand and he was all ready to sacrifice his son. And you say, well, now that's terrible. That's a terrible story. How could a fa any father do that if he really loved his son? Here's the answer. This is why you got to study the Bible and know it, okay? The answer is given to you in Hebrews chapter 11. What's the answer? Here it is, very simple. God, it tells us right there in Hebrews 11. It says this. Abraham had such faith that he even believed that God could raise his son from the dead. And by the way, there hadn't been anybody risen from the dead in the previous years before Abraham. He'd never seen that. You talk about some faith, that's faith, isn't it? And so right at that point where Abraham is ready, God says, God, God's angel came and said, okay, Abraham, stop, stop. I know now that you love me more than your son. And I want you to take that ram that I've put over there in the thicket and bring that ram over and sacrifice that animal instead of Isaac. And that animal sacrifice was a symbolic prophecy of Jesus Christ, who would be the perfect sacrifice for your sins and mine. One more before we move to communion and the Passover. Exodus chapter 12 is about the Passover. I encourage you to read that. God's people are about to be taken out of Egypt by God in the Exodus. And God told Moses to tell the people that in Exodus 12, 7, the people must take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. Then God, Moses called all the older leaders of Israel together and said, get the animals for your families and kill the lamb for the Passover. You say, what's that about? Okay, here it is. God said, every family in, in the children of Israel, every family unit, get a perfect lamb. Sacrifice the lamb. Make a meal. But before you eat the meal, take the blood of that perfect lamb and put it on the doorpost. One, two, three. Three places. God said this. When I, see, when I send the death angel through Egypt, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the Jewish people celebrated Passover from that day all the way time way through down down through Jesus. And they still do today because they don't realize, sadly, many Jewish people don't realize that Jesus Christ was their perfect lamb. But if you have dear Jewish friends, you can you can you know, congratulate them at Hanukkah and all that. But I would say this to you. You might also want to just pass along to them that you know that they revere the Old Testament. And so you have a, a great Old Testament chapter you'd like to share with them. And then if they have opportunity to read it and talk to you about it, you'd like to hear what they think about it. And here it is. Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. That's Isaiah 53, 7. By the way, that's Jesus before those men that accused him, right, at his crucifixion. They said, don't you have anything to say? He was falsely accused. What are you and I doing when we're falsely accused? Well, we have lots to say, don't we? Jesus didn't say a word. He didn't open his mouth. And so number five, the lamb was fulfilled in the New Testament. John 1, the next day, John saw Jesus. This is John the Baptist. Saw Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. John 1, 29 and 36. Acts 8, 32. God sent Philip down in the desert to meet 
an Ethiopian secretary of finance who's reading a scroll, the place of the scripture which he was reading was this. Uh, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter as a lamb is silent before the shears. He did not open his mouth. And the Ethiopian finance guy says to Philip, who is he talking about, him, uh, the prophet? He's talking about himself, Isaiah, or some other man. All right, here's cool part. It says, then Philip opened his mouth and began in the same scripture, and he preached unto him Jesus. Jesus. Philip, the evangelist, took Isaiah 53 and applied it to Jesus Christ. That's how I know it's about Jesus. God's word is the best commentary on itself. Now, I have lots of commentaries, and I read them, but the Bible is the best commentary on itself. So right there, Acts 8, 32 and 33, that comments and explains Isaiah 53, 7. And so, number six, Jesus turned the Passover into the Lord's Supper, the Lord's table. Matthew 26, the passage I'll read from in just a moment. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the followers came to Jesus and said, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover meal? Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to prepare for you the Passover meal? So obviously, as practicing Jews who kept the law, they were going to have a Passover meal together. Verse 18. Go into the city, Jesus said to a certain man, and tell him, the teacher says, the chosen time is near. I will have the Passover with my followers at your house. The followers did what Jesus told them to do, and they prepared the Passover meal. In the evening, Jesus was sitting at the table with his 12 followers. So there in Matthew 26, Jesus is eating the Passover meal with his 12 disciples. Now, at the end of that meal, it says in verse 26, while they were eating, so it's a Passover meal. They ate that. Jesus took some bread and thanked God for it and broke it. And he gave it to his followers. And he said, take this bread and eat it. This is my body. And by the way, they knew that he wasn't feeding them his literal flesh because he was standing there in a body, okay? That's why I know that the communion wafer is symbolic. It's not the flesh of Christ. Verse 27, then Jesus took a cup and thanked God for it, gave it to the followers. He said, every one of you drink this, this is my blood. Again, they knew it wasn't his real blood, which is the new agreement that God makes with his people. Now watch, this blood is poured out for many, well, here it is, to forgive their sins. The word remission in the King James means forgiveness of sin. And so Jesus took the Passover meal and he turned it into the Lord's table, the Lord's supper communion, which is we're about to partake of together. So number seven, he died, was buried, rose again to be the cure for the sin disease. First Corinthians 15, 19, if our hope in Christ is for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone else in the world. But Christ has truly been raised from the dead, the first one in proof that those who sleep in death will also be raised. Death has come because of what one man did, but the rising from death also comes because of one man. In Adam, all of us die. In the same way, in Christ, all of us are made alive. That's why in Revelation 5, 9, in the new song that they sing to the Lamb, they sing that you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were killed and with the blood of your death, you brought people to God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. That's the gospel, friends, right there. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. By the way, that's the connector, watch, between Christmas and Easter, okay? Jesus had to come to this world and live a sinless life so that he could, as the Lamb of God, be sacrificed for my sins, for your sins. And so he lived a sinless life for 33 years on the earth, something none of us can do. Then he died on the cross for my sins, for your sins, and he rose from the grave so that he could give eternal life to anyone who asked him, who believed in him, who trusted him. I got to give you one more thing here. Number eight, he's coming back as the Lamb of God. He's coming back. Now, I already read for you Revelation 5, 9. Revelation 5, 12 says, They said in a loud voice, the Lamb who was killed 
is worthy to receive power, wealth, wisdom, and strength, honor, glory, and praise. Now here, get this scripture. Revelation 17, 14. They will make war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will defeat them. Because he have Lord of lords and King of kings, he'll defeat them with his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Hallelujah. And so Jesus Christ came the first time, first advent, right? He's coming back okay, as the Lamb of God. And I don't set any dates, but I believe it's getting much closer. And that's why as the world gets more and more crazy wicked, you should rejoice. Not at the wickedness, but you should rejoice because the Bible says, as that happens, lift up your heads because your redemption draws nigh. That means be watching. Be watching. Jesus Christ is coming back for his followers at the rapture first, and then to bring peace to the world as the Prince of Peace rules in the kingdom age with a rod of iron. Now, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the perfect Lamb of God's sacrifice can't help you. Let me show, let me just take the metaphor from Exodus. We'll use that for, for what we're about to do in my invitation. And I have a question for you based upon just what you heard me read from Exodus, okay? If the Jewish people had taken the, the lamb and the sacrifice and they had killed the lamb, ate the meal, but they said then, watch, if they had said this, oh, well, we believe Moses and we believe in God, but we're not going to take some blood and put that on our doorpost because that's, we, that, doesn't, that doesn't appeal to us. That's that's disgusting. All right, now get notice it. But they said they believed, okay? They believed. See, we got a lot of people like that today. Oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I believe the baby Jesus came to be the Savior. Yeah, I believe all that, okay? Here's a question. Have you allowed God to take the blood of Jesus Christ and apply it to your heart to wash away your sins? See, a lot of people have never done that. And they're the people, they're like the people I talked about earlier in my sermon where they took the, the hymns out of the hymn books and said, oh, that's a bloody religion. We don't want that. Well, my friends, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And if you want that blood symbolically, metaphorically, spiritually applied to wash away your sins, you have to believe and receive. So you have to be obedient. And they had to put the blood on the doorposts. And you have to allow God because you believe and ask him to to take away your sin. And if you'll ask him to, he will. I'm going to help you ask if you'd like to right now. Let's bow our heads and hearts, please. With our heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around, if you've never asked God to apply to your heart the sacrifice of the perfect Lamb of God. But you understand it today. You'd like to do that. You've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior personally. You'd like to do that today. Then I invite you right now to pray this prayer with me. Dear God, just silently from your heart to God's. Dear God, I do believe <clears throat> Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins as your perfect Lamb. I repent of my sins, and I accept and receive Jesus Christ, your perfect Lamb, as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for saving me, giving me forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And help me now to live my life for you. And tell others what I've done here today. In Jesus' name I pray. While well, their heads still bowed and eyes still closed, if you prayed that prayer a minute, God heard you, and God saved you and gave you eternal life. I'd like to thank him for doing that for you if you'd let me. If you're here in the room today and you prayed that prayer with me, if you're not ashamed of what you did, and I'm sure you're not, then just quietly lift your hand. 
by that raised hand, you're saying, yes, I did that today. And I accepted Jesus Christ personally today as my Lord and Savior. Just lift your hand up and then put it down. I'll see your hand and God will see your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. I'd just like to thank God for saving you. And if you're watching online, we'd be glad to help you to know some scriptures so you can grow in your Christian life. I'd be glad to send you some helpful literature, but we need to, you need to reach out to us either through our website, through the contact us page, or through the comment section here on the live stream, or else by just emailing us. We'll be glad to help you any way we can. Father, we thank you for hearing us today. Thank you for Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God. As we celebrate together now, communion, the Lord's table, help us to remember and be grateful to you for what Jesus did. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As we move now to partake together of communion, I invite you, if you have not seen that before in your Bible, to turn to Matthew 26, but uh, we're going to take these uh, communion disposable things. And if you take the, the clear, it's totally clear, uh, the top layer, not the silver layer. If you open the silver one, that's that's the juice. That That's second. So uh, there's a small flat wafer underneath on top of the, on top of the tin foil, underneath a, uh, clear covering and this is a representation only of the body of Jesus Christ and uh, if you get yours out I'm going to read a scripture and then we'll partake together and again if you're not able to get it open I apologize in advance you can pick up another one uh, on your way out if you'd like to Matthew chapter 26, verse 26, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Let's partake together. Father, I thank you for the body of Christ that was placed upon the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. Thank you for the blood of Christ that was shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you that you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten son, that Jesus' blood died. He died and shed his blood so that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you that you said whosoever will may come. Whoever comes to be out no wise cast out. So as we partake together of the blood of Christ, symbolically, shed for many, we do so with thanksgiving for all that Jesus suffered and did for us on the cross. In his name I pray, amen. So if you're able to carefully take off the tinfoil wrapper that's on top of the grape juice, we'll partake together after I read this brief scripture. Jesus said next in Matthew 26, then he took the cup. That's in verse 27. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink from it all of you for this is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Shall we partake together? We'll have trash cans by the door for you to Throw away your uh, disposable cups there if you'd like to as you go out. Uh, right before we have our closing carol, I'm going to ask Steve Alexander to go to the sound booth and get the uh, microphone. We'd like to just give a brief opportunity. If anybody has a, a brief public word of testimony. Now, because of COVID, we can't have you hold the mic, all right? But we can allow Steve just to come to you with the microphone you can speak into it 
we do it that way because there's no value in your testimony if people can't hear it, right? So if you have a brief word of testimony or praise before we stand for the closing carol, just raise your hand and Steve will come to you with the mic right now. Anybody at all? Brief word of testimony or praise, all right? Down here, Steve. Just as you testify, just give your name briefly and then your testimony. Hello, my name's David Schaefer. Um, my daughter this week was faced with a decision whether to turn her kids over to her father and put them directly in harm's way for their Christmas vacation, or she would be in contempt of the state of Pennsylvania. Now, my wife and I didn't help her with that decision, and we sought as many places as we could to get a stay of that order. But in the end, my daughter decided to be in contempt of court. But I want to praise God that I do believe she made a God-honoring decision, and I don't think she could have made that decision without God. Man, thank you. Someone else. Report of testimony or praise. Okay, over there. I don't know Justin or Maxine, but I have a testimony when the Pastor Bill spoke about the blood being taken out of a hymnal. We witnessed that. Went to a church who I loved going to because of my friends and relatives were there. And the head minister came there one Sunday morning with a meeting and told us we will no longer be using these hymnals because the blood has to be taken out. The result was the pastor then, who was a man that came from a, a tough family, but became a wonderful Christian and a wonderful minister, he said, I do not believe in that. What happened with him was he was born and raised in Lebanon County, and he was sent to Gap, Pennsylvania. But the good thing about it, uh, on a journey to finding another church, I ended up here. And I love the people, and we could never have a more wonderful pastor who speaks to us with lots of words of wisdom. So I do know those things can happen. And uh, But the journey brought me here, and that's the good thing that happened. Amen. Thank you, Maxine. We're glad you came here. Herb Garber texted me, I praise God for the technology that allows us to worship remote. So we're thankful for those that can worship remotely with us. Anyone else, a brief word of testimony or praise that you'd like to share? All right, down front here. Then I'm going to ask the praise team to slowly begin to gather on the platform. If you do that right now, this will be the final testimony. And uh, we'll close with a great carol together. So praise team, you can come as Michelle shares. My name is Michelle. And this season just reminds us of what life is with Jesus and how desperately horrible it is without him. And the blessing of the snow reminds us that our sins are washed whiter than snow. I know a lot of people hate snow, but one of the first snowfalls that we ever get always reminds me that the blood makes us whiter than snow. And you think about how can something so red make you so pure, but because Jesus' blood was pure, it makes us pure. And there's nothing that can compare to the forgiveness that God gives us and then that we're able to share with other people and also show other people forgiveness even when they think they are unforgivable. And we are not unforgivable because God proved that by sending his son. And that's something that we definitely need to share is that God loves everybody. And he did send his son as a baby. The God that created the universe put himself in an egg to be born a baby, the God of the universe. That should blow your mind. Amen. Amen. Yes, go ahead. Hey. Thank you for raising your hand and giving that testimony. You'd have been in the doghouse if you would, if you hadn't. 
And that was the smart man, the <clears throat> smart young man. Uh, congratulations to Nate, Holly, and Claire Bretz for their engagement. All right, let's stand together now, and we'll sing O Little Town of Bethlehem. We're going to sing Christmas Eve, some carols, and we'll sing, um, we'll sing O si Silent Night at the close. And we do have uh, electric candles that we're going to, we'll have them sanitized and wa wiped off. And they'll be in a basket for you that, you know, nobody else will have touched them. They'll, people with gloves will sanitize them. So you can pick yours up and come in and then you leave it there as you go out, all right, with another basket so we can use them next year. We'll have a great time. A short won't be, won't be an hour long. It'll probably be more like a half an hour, okay? Uh, Christmas Eve service from 6 o'clock through 6.30. Let's sing a little Town of Bethlehem now as we close. more about this in the message on Sunday, on Christmas Eve, but in case you're not able to be here to hear that message, I, the Holy Spirit's directed me to tell you this. The best gift that you can give this Christmas beyond Jesus, okay, but, but connected is forgiveness, and I'm not talking now about your own sins, all right? The best gift that you can give yourself this Christmas is to forgive anybody in your circle that you know needs forgiveness. And when you forgive people, you're not letting them off the hook. You're not condoning what they did wrong. You are letting yourself off the hook, and you will not suffer ongoing bitterness and everything bad that goes with it, all right? So I don't know who needs this. Probably all of us do. But, and I, you know I haven't said this any other Christmases before, but the best Christmas gift you can give yourself is to forgive. All right. 
And Ephesians 4.32, if you want scriptural, you know, justification for that, that's where it tells us to. Be kind one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. I didn't deserve God's forgiveness when he forgave me. He forgave me. And if you forgive people, God will honor you and you'll reap the results, the blessing in your own life. Hebrews 12, 14, and 15 also teaches that. Let's say together now the prayer that Jesus gave his disciples, and it's kind of interesting. I wasn't thinking of that as, we, as I gave that admonition, but uh, that forgiveness is in the Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Glad to